Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, welcome to today's webinar, How to Fill Vacant Storefronts, a topic that we hear about all the time. Um, we're excited to bring this to you by Connecticut Main Street Center. My name is Kristen Lopez. I am the Education and Training Director. And before we jump into this great topic, um, just a few words. Connecticut Main Street Center is the expert resource for developing and sustaining vibrant downtowns and main streets that fuel our state's prosperity. Our mission is to assess, to educate, to convene, and to advocate to develop and grow downtowns. We are grateful to our sponsors and funding partners, Connecticut Main Street Center's Founding sponsors are Eversource and the State of Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development. Our growth sponsors are Avon Grid and the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office. Our educational programs are sponsored by Webster Bank and Avon Grid, with thanks to our corporate investors, Penn Globe and Capital for Change. Connecticut Main Street Center also has important strategic partnerships, including our partnership with FHI Studio, our AICP certification maintenance provider. A note to the planners, this webinar is approved for one um, continuing education credit. And some quick housekeeping notes. This webinar is about an hour long, um, but there will be plenty of times for questions at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat box as we go. Um, I'll go back and facilitate those questions at the end when we're there. And after this webinar, you will receive uh, an evaluation survey. Please complete it. Um, it's really important to us so that we can develop more meaningful educational programs for you. So at Connecticut Main Street Center, we believe that for a vibrant and sustainable Main Street, um, they really have these six components. One, there's a unique sense of place. Um, there's economic vitality. There's community engagement and policies that support appropriate growth. There's equitable places and inclusive practices, sustainable practices and protection of natural, natural resources, and there's connectivity with a focus on multimodal transit. Today, today's topic on filling vacant storefronts is a challenge we hear all of the time in the field talking with our members. And rightfully so, vacant storefronts have a tremendous negative impact on your main streets, sense of place, and economic vitality. And so with that, I'm super excited to bring to you today's speaker. Um, uh, a few months ago, I, pray, uh, I came across an op-ed in Next City by our speaker, Ilana Proust. As we move through the pandemic, here's how to fill vacant storefronts. And we just had to reach out to her um, because this is a topic we hear all the time. And so there's actually the link to that article um, in the chat box right now. And a little bit more about Ilana. Ilana Proust is the founder and CEO of Recast City and the author of the new book, Recast Your City, How to Save Your Downtown with Small Scale Manufacturing. In fact, for our members, um, you'll be getting a copy of this book in your next field site visit. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, Ilana Pruce's passion for great places grew out of her experience working with small and large cities all over the country when she led the technical assistance program at the US EPA Smart Growth Program and as the Vice President and Chief of Staff at Smart Growth America. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Urban and Regional Studies from Cornell University and a Master's of City Planning from the University of Maryland. And also in the chat box is a link to her website so you can learn more about all of her great work. And with that, Ilana, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and send it over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kristen, for having me here today and for inviting me to be a part of this. I'm very excited to talk with everybody today. Um, and like Kristen described, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys a, a bit of a chat, a bit of a presentation, but I really, um, I feel like we get into the meat of it when we have a conversation. So please think of questions you wanna ask or examples that you're looking for, and, and we will really chew through it all together when we get to Q&A. So, 
We're going to talk about vacant storefronts today, um, and specifically storefronts because because uh, I know there's challenges in in vacant housing and there's challenges in vacant office space right now. But we're going to really specifically talk about storefronts today because storefronts are, from my perspective, the heart, uh, sort of the heart and soul of downtown, of of creating a place where people want to come together, where people want to spend money, where people want to grow their businesses, and. When I think about vacant storefronts, I immediately start thinking about entrepreneurs and all the attention entrepreneurship has gotten nationally, as well as Main Streets. The outcry during the pandemic about saving our Main Streets, saving our downtown, saving our small businesses, which obviously is not where it was just a couple of years ago, but we're going to talk about that. Um, we know that entrepreneurship is this hot topic. There's an endless supply of articles about entrepreneurship, young entrepreneurship, millennial entrepreneurship, now Gen Z entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship for retirees. This is like, this is something that is everywhere. And there's a big gap, I would say, between a lot of this talk and how we apply it in each of our communities and specifically on our main streets and in our downtowns. Because we know that there is this amazing opportunity to bring people together. And in fact, there's phenomenal research that shows that when small business owners have strong ties to other business owners, they're twice as likely to succeed. And when they have strong connections to appropriate mentors, they're also twice as likely to succeed. So connection, I'm going to come back to this again and again, even though we're ultimately talking about real estate, I'm going to talk to you about the small businesses too and their needs. And so those connections and the space to make those connections become really important. We know that there are all sorts of real estate models that are coming up, right? Food halls are one example of how we're filling space, creating space for entrepreneurs, creating space for startups, and bringing people together. There's a phenomenal um, study done years ago called Soul of the Community that shows why people are tied to small and medium-sized places, and it's they feel included, there are places to gather, and there's some aesthetic beauty, either the natural environment or the built environment. So when we're thinking about Main Street, when we're thinking about our downtowns, we have so much opportunity to hit all three of those as we're investing in the place. And yes, vacant storefronts are a challenge. We also have this amazing growth of energy around shopping local, about supporting our own local businesses, um, and being able to really make sure we're doing it in a way that that addresses inclusivity, that reaches the demographic diversity of our community. I always ask the question of who gets the storefronts, right? It's, it's in fact something that we can be incredibly purposeful about to build more wealth for more people. And there are ways of putting businesses into storefronts that we didn't, wouldn't necessarily have thought about them before. Um, I think about product businesses a lot, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. A little bit about me, for those of you I've never met before. Um, I believe in great places so I'm, uh, and, and making stuff. Those are my two of my many passions at the moment. On the left, you can see a picture of, um, this is me in high school, my very short hair. Uh, and um, that's a, an electric blue dress that my mother sewed for me. She sewed, she knit, she crocheted, she painted. She taught us all how to use drills and, and fix things. Um, I grew up in a house where just being busy to make something and do something with your hands was the natural state that we were in, um, never really knowing that that was actually a business you could have. Um, it was just what we did. On the right, I had this amazing opportunity uh, now a while ago to give a TEDx talk about the economic power of great places. And the constant line or consistent line in my work over the last 25 years is about creating great places for the people who live there now. What does that mean? The other constant is these amazing kids that I also teach how to use drills and build stuff and make stuff. And you should see the things we make out of copper pipes. But um, the focus of Recast City and obviously of the book Recast Your City um, is about how we work with downtowns and community leaders and small business leadership to create a strong community of small businesses in downtown with a specific focus on product businesses. I call them small scale manufacturing. These are businesses that can make something that you can replicate or package. My shorthand for it is hot sauce, handbags, or hardware. This can be everything from the part-time or full-time artisan creating a product at home to food production to advanced manufacturing and sort of everything in between, but at a scale that fits into your downtown. So that may, if you're a smaller main street, it might be one to 20 employees. If you have a bigger downtown, it might be up to 50 employees. 
opportunities, but really looking at this opportunity around product businesses to draw energy into a downtown because they're selling online, they might be selling wholesale, and they're not completely dependent on that foot traffic like traditional retail would be. We'll get to them in a minute. But this is this is what I do. And it's about placemaking. It's about creating great, these great places, but it's also about creating stronger economies for more people. So what are we talking about today? Vegan storefronts are everywhere. I don't care if you're in a big city or small town, there are vegan storefronts everywhere. It has only gotten worse since the pandemic. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different reasons why this is going on. And I wanna talk through that just briefly. There are some communities where the cost of renovation and the lease that somebody can get for that space are completely off. They're, they're, they're upside down right now. Um, that's because of the cost of construction being really high. And it could be because the, um, the market in that location is just not that strong. And the cost of construction being high has really um, become a barrier to a lot of the renovations. Um, not even talking about historic buildings um, where there might be other criteria and re requirements, um, but this is a major barrier that we're seeing in a lot of places. We also see in some communities, and this breaks my heart every time I see this, particularly I see this a lot across the Midwest and the South. I don't know enough to, this might be happening in, in Connecticut cities and towns as well, um, that there are people who are distant property owners and are holding on to a piece of property in, on Main Street in downtown. And honestly, they're just taking it as a loss because they're making somebody some money somewhere else. And it is not worth their while to take a lower lease on that and fill it because when they say that the cost is this high and they can't fill it, they can take a, a tax benefit on that loss. And that is heartbreaking, but something that it does exist. There's also reasons around underwriting. So when we have big projects, um, particularly the newer projects, the newer mixed use projects that have gone into a lot of communities, they don't want to price their um, retail, their storefronts um, at a lower price because it devalues the underwriting of their whole project. And so if they're looking to sell it at some point um, or looking to refinance it at some point, it changes their whole underwriting and it is better for them to hold onto it even for a bunch of years empty then lease it at a lower rate. And it's important to understand each of these pieces because it's going to be different in each of your communities. And then the one that I just drives me nuts maybe the most, and this is most often with either a mall or a big box strip center, so not as much about downtown, but it could be the case, is that there's a, a major anchor tenant that has a guaranteed lease. It means that they are paying that property owner for that lease for an extended period of time so that nobody else can come into that space. But it means that that city, that community is suffering for all of this. And then the last one, which I think is in the case in a lot of community communities, is there's a mismatch of real estate needs and small business needs. The size of the spaces that we have on our main streets and in our downtowns are different than what small businesses need today. A lot of communities have storefronts that are 5,000 square feet, 10,000 square feet, even 2,000 square feet, honestly, in some cases. And a lot of the small business needs right now are 500 square feet or 1,000 square feet. And so we have to find solutions that are fixing this mismatch in a way that both serves the needs of the small business owners as well as the property owners. So what does all of this mean? Um, I wanna give us a little bit of context about sort of where we are today because, and I, I assume you guys know this because of the work that you guys do, but right, vacant buildings, reduce the, the, the value of the nearby property. The, it's going to reduce property tax revenue. It's going to reduce sales tax revenue. It's going to depress the number of people who want to be in that place. It's going to kill foot traffic. It, it creates a feeling of isolation in the community. The impact of these vacancies on our communities are multifold um, and create this downward spiral in a lot of cases, unless we really wrap around it in a way that we're very purposefully creating short-term, very visible wins and bigger long-term initiatives. So why else does all of this matter? I, we're going to talk a little bit about the context we're in today, right? Because the thing I want to make sure we're acknowledging in all of this is that our economic development and planning actions have excluded some people in places for a long time. There are We have a history of the have and have nots, um, and I think it is important for us to go into these conversations with sort of our eyes wide open about what that means and what we, what we are coming from and where we want to go, right? 
This is an old number. I did not update this because once we passed a million deaths, I honestly have had a hard time updating this. The impact of COVID, the impact of COVID deaths on our communities is going to take a long time for us to understand. And um, we, we've been through this and we're all traumatized by it. And, and in some communities, the number of deaths are much higher. And in some neighborhoods, the, the percent of deaths is much higher, but the impact on our households, on our economy, on our individual cells is something that I think we have to sort of take a moment in each time, each time we have a conversation about growth and small business in downtown, we need to acknowledge that we have been through all of this. This also obviously COVID impacted our small businesses that many small, most of our small businesses closed for months. It's hard to remember already in 2020 what that looked like. I feel like we've all tried to protect ourselves and it's almost like everybody wants to forget that that happened. Um, but the reality is, is a lot of businesses pivoted and some survived and many did not. And we are now seeing a, in some ways, this sort of weird, not weird, but this growth because of a have to situation. People created small businesses because they lost their jobs. People created small businesses because they lost their job and could finally pursue their passion. People created small businesses because they realized that the quality of life that they had before was not what they wanted and they want to pursue another way to get there. And what it means is we have a lot of people who in the last few years have started businesses without a lot of business experience, which is something we need to figure out. We also have this huge change of employment. We know that the they called it the great resignation and now it's the great shift. You can call it whatever you want, but there's a huge shift in what the jobs are, what the pay scale is. And this isn't just in terms of people looking for better paying jobs, which is huge. It's also the side of small business owners needing to understand what they need to pay employees to actually have and recruit employees, which is not the same math that it was five years ago. But even before the pandemic, we were in this great demographic shift. The vast majority of counties were seeing a decline in working age adult population. Um, and that's uh, an enormous impact. That's that's the aging of the population, that's brain train, right? That's all of these different patterns that were going on nationally. We also, before the pandemic, recorded the highest income inequality we've ever recorded nationally. And my guess is that's only gotten worse through the pandemic. So there are these challenges that we're facing. We also have a history um, where if we look at the, the history of the net worth of a median white household versus uh, the net worth of a median black household, um, we have an enormous difference. And this is true of our Hispanic households too. Um, but when we look at black household wealth, um, we see that there, we know that there are so many barriers that have been created to exclude people from opportunity. Um, and these are just a few of them, right? That that we need to acknowledge that we have a, a history of exclusions and we have a current reality of lower paying jobs that are predominant in um, the black community and the Hispanic community. And that if we wanna really address this wealth gap that is there, we need to create more, purposefully create more opportunity now. On top of all that, not to keep piling on, but I wanna make sure we're clear about where we are, we have a huge change going on in our retail world, right? A lot of the major national chains have shrunk their footprint. They only wanna be in super prime locations. They don't wanna be in marginal locations. They only wanna be in places that have phenomenal foot tra traffic already. A lot of them are also shrinking the footprint of their stores because they don't need as much space. It's more of a, a demo space versus a seeing every single thing that's there and having everything on the shelves. So that's that's a huge change. And then when we look at metro areas versus non-metro areas, I know you guys are a fairly urban place, but, but we have this huge shift in where jobs are in the country. Um, and that's an important thing to recognize that, that, that there are places that had good paying jobs even a decade ago that really are missing a ton of jobs at this point. So what's at stake with all of this, right? Why, why are we focusing on this? Um, one of the things that's really exciting to me is this world of small businesses and small scale manufacturing. So I, I'm just going to give you a quick, a quick background on small scale manufacturing for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Small scale manufacturing, as I said, are businesses that make a product. So if we look at uh, consumer products, um, this is CO Ceramics. Uh, CO Ceramics has a 400 square foot space. Uh, and they can sell their product there and make their product there. They also sell online and they also sell wholesale. That means that in one little spot, 
they have at least three different sources of revenue. Oh, and they do the biggest uh, pop-up markets that are in the, the region as well. So they have four different sources of revenue coming into one little space. And that makes that business incredibly resilient. The potential to, for growth is amazing. And they're creating good paying jobs. Small scale manufacturing businesses on average are paying 50 to 100% more than retailer service jobs. And it's a person obviously creating wealth for themselves as well um, as they grow this business. We also have ones that are, are product-based, right? They, they may not need to be a storefront. It might be that they only do wholesale, uh, the tortilla maker um, or the, the widget maker who you know, creates the, the refined pieces for NASA, right? There are some businesses that are small-scale manufacturing that don't need to be in storefronts, but when we have small-scale manufacturing in storefronts, we have this opportunity to put a business there that isn't dependent on foot traffic because of those all of those other sources of revenue, but can be a huge draw because people love seeing something being made. They wanna come look in the window, they wanna come in the store and see those things being made. So as we're looking at what can fill the storefronts, if you have storefronts that are vacant, but in a, in a, in a sort of fine state of repair, this is a good place to start and an important place to start the conversation because we know we wanna create these great places downtown. We wanna bring people together. People are desperate to be together. I was just sharing with our, our hosts before you guys came on. I went to an event last night outdoors um, with people from uh, a really around the region, around the country getting together and people were giddy to be together and get to talk to each other more. And so going into the fall and the winter, we have these amazing opportunities to bring people together around artisans and small scale manufacturing or any other kind of program. So what do we do? If we're looking at vacant storefronts from a real estate perspective, I'm going to go through a few examples right now. So we talked about small scale manufacturing. There's a whole world of small business support that we can provide for them, financing that they need. People, bankers don't have any idea what the sector is. So financing from CFIs or revolving loan funds becomes an essential part of that. That's one bucket. When we look at um, what we're doing with um, incubator or accelerators or, or support programs, we really need to think about how we're helping them grow slowly with deep roots. There's this great study that came out from I think it was the Harvard Business Review last year. And it said that the programs that help businesses grow fast, right? Like the tech high growth, they often are growing fast and leaving, especially our smaller cities um, are, and, and going somewhere else. But when we help, we have programs that help businesses grow slowly with deep roots connecting to the assets that are in their community in their region, they grow deep roots, they grow stronger and they stay. And that's what we're really looking at um, as part of the solution here. So we wanna fill storefronts with businesses that draw foot traffic, right? We wanna create these places that people want can be together again, programming as a part of the solution, but we also want things that draw people out. This is Zeke's Coffee. Um, front is a coffee shop, back is a coffee roaster. They ship out to the wholesale to the entire region out the back door, right? It was the first thing on a block with, I would say, half a dozen vacancies. And now every single one of those vacancies is full because they started pulling people in to this storefront, but they weren't, their model was not dependent on foot traffic for it all to work. So what do we do? What are the actions you can start looking at to take? I have four for you. And if you read the article, these are not gonna be a surprise, but there's a lot of other ones we can talk about too. One is look, consider a commercial vacancy tax ordinance. There are a number of cities, big and small, that have this now. This says, more or less, to property owners, you must be a good steward to our community. You may not just sit on an, a vacant property um, and depress property values and sales tax around you. If you leave it vacant for more than X period of time, sometimes it's six months, sometimes it's a year, without doing active work on renovating it and getting a lease in place, then you will pay a fee. It takes oversight. It takes political will. Um, it needs to be a fee at a high enough level that we're creating a disincentive for people to sit on this vacant property. Um, also, uh, um, oversight of um, building, oh, the word is just not coming to my head at this moment, um, making sure the building is in a state of good repair, um, that obviously needs to be there in place. But there's a number of cities that have done this and it really helps um, discourage that kind of speculation and that kind of just sort of squatting on these buildings as they deteriorate underneath them. Second is tax increment finance or other funding vehicles 
for matching grants, particularly with not only storefront, right? Facade improvement is something that a lot of places are familiar with, um, but also with retail build out. Longmont, Colorado has a phenomenal initiative that is funded through, through TIF, um, where they provide matching grants for retail renovations, because a lot of them have either been empty for a long time or they got turned into office space over time on their downtown, and they wanna turn it back into retail. And so they do a matching grant for build out, but the property owner has to show that they have a, a, a business that's going to move in. So they have to prove that it's going to be used. Um, and it's made an enormous difference um, for their downtown to have that kind of matching grant. Then there's this whole world of who owns the properties. Um, I am an, a huge proponent that local ownership and particularly local business ownership uh, is the way to go. Not every small business in the community is going to have the finances in place to be able to buy a building. That's really important to recognize. But there might be a few local business owners who really believe in the community, have the community's interest at heart, who could move their business into that space, bring other businesses into that space, and really be a good partner. Pittsburgh uh, has a, a great program. Uh, I think it's called Avenues of Hope, because it's Hope Avenue, where they identified that they have a whole bunch of vacant properties, and they identified, they more or less did an open call to business owners who think they have the financial wherewithal to be able to buy a building, but they never, they don't know how to do it. And so what they do is they sort of take this request for, for interest or request for qualification and scope out the business's finances to think if, if they see if it's possible, if they're positioned well for it. And then they train that business owner and take them through the process of becoming the property owner in a target location. And they help finance it with low cost loans. So it's really thinking soup to nuts about what does it mean to change this trajectory? And this is something that we look at with small businesses also, right? There's amazing programs out there now that take home-based businesses that want to be in storefronts and they take them through a training for product businesses about how do you go into a storefront? What do you need to do? Are you pricing right? Are you doing distribution right? How do you do the marketing? And then introduce them to property owners and provide grants for, for prop, these home-based product businesses to move into storefronts. So when we think about the changes we want to make, we have to know very specifically what are the biggest barriers from the property owner's perspective as well as the business owner's perspective so we can fill in those gaps. And then the last one, which is pretty hard, but is a really amazing opportunity is commercial land trusts, um, especially or land banks, um, especially where we have a lot of vacancies. Can we create an entity that can buy and hold those? and then help identify the best partners to, to renovate and build those spaces. Um, there's a lot of other opportunities you know, around there where we can bring in federal funding for something like this, where there's nonprofits involved, but this is, this is really a, a great place to start with that. So with Recast City, as I said, you know, we're really focused on helping bring small scale manufacturing businesses into downtown, and create these thriving places, um, because it's where people love to be, right? And, and that we want not only that thriving economy, but we want that vibrancy. We want that energy. We want that pride of place um, to come together with the people who live in that community now. Um, as Kristen said, I, I did write a book. Uh, it, was, it's, uh, it was an amazing adventure to write a book. Um, it's called Recast Your City, How to Save Your Downtown with Small-Scale Manufacturing. If you're not a member, um, and you, or even if you are and you haven't gotten your copy yet, if you'd like to get uh, the first chapter for free, you can go to the book's website called recastyourcity.com um, and, and check it out. Um, the other thing out there is the major way we work with communities, which is called Recast Leaders. And that's a 10-month program where we teach and coach and mentor communities to do this work. Um, who are your small, what are you trying to achieve? Who are your small scale manufacturers? How do you engage them and your property owners? What are actions you can take specific to your challenges? In the next three to six months and help you implement those actions. Um, we're going to be opening applications for this program in the next month. Um, if you're interested, I can send you guys a link to, to more information about it. We always start with a one-week project called a SPARK um, to make sure that you understand the opportunity and the urgency around this work and see if this is actually a fit for where you're going. So uh, it's a one-week low-cost project, and, and but Recast Leaders will open applications in, a, in just a few weeks. Um, 
So best places to find me, get the free chapter, join me on LinkedIn. Um, I definitely post all of the best things I see going on around the country I share on LinkedIn. Um, and I, I can post this uh, link in the chat as well. So it's easier to get to. Before I wrap up, I just want to sort of give you one other picture, right? And this is the question of what do we get? And th this, I think, is the important place to start in every one of our conversations, which is, what is that magic wand vision? What do we want to see at the end of this process that, that we know we want to get to, right? And, and be able to describe it in detail, right? We want businesses that can scale and stay in our community. Um, we want businesses that have good paying jobs on our main street and in downtown. We want to help build more equitable wealth within the community as well. And we want busy storefronts, right? We want people on the street. We want people running into friends and neighbors and family um, and stopping in to say hi to a friend and, and create that energy where people believe in the good and the greatness of the community and they see opportunity um, and they're excited by it. So I hope you uh, enjoy this. I'm happy to, to, to take any questions that you have, uh, talk about any examples that you wanna dive into and, and help you guys figure out how to make this a reality. Excellent, Ilana, thank you so much. Um, I was taking furious notes here. I want to um, give people some time to uh, type in questions. Um, Bruce, I see your question here, we'll get to it in a minute. I know we had some people that uh, kind of came in a little bit later, so I want to do a quick recap on, because Ilana, you gave a great overview of why we have vacant storefronts and some really actionable ways that we can fill these storefronts. So one, just real quick, uh, for why we have vacant storefronts, the cost of renovation um, doesn't make sense to, to do the work. Um, the tax benefit on the loss of keeping a vacant storefront, um, it can devalue underwriting. And so it's better to leave the places vacant. Um, there could be a guaranteed lease where a major you know, uh, anchor is paying a lease for a long period of time and no one else can get that lease even though it stays vacant. And there's a mismatch of real estate needs. So there's a lot of 5,000 square foot places, but really small businesses need 500 or 1,000 square feet. And then just re real quick, some of the actionable steps that you gave that you listed out were implementing commercial vacancy tax ordinance, which can take some political will, but could actually incentivize people to do something with their storefront. Um, TIF funding with matching grants, um, finance local business real estate ownership, and um, develop commercial land trusts, um, which again is a heavy lift, but can have really huge benefit. Um, and then also the huge point that you made as well is how do we support our small businesses? Um, you know, not just talking about what we can do from the pressure on the property owner side, but also how we can support the small businesses. Did I wrap that up? Phenomenal. That <laughs> okay. was very impressive. Okay, perfect. Well, one of, um, I know we have a couple of quick questions in here. So um, actually, yeah, we'll just get to the quick questions uh, or not the quick questions, but the answers here. So if possible, would you be interested in learning more about training? Um, I'd be interested in learning more about training programs to take home-based businesses and put them in storefronts. Any examples Absolutely. of that? Absolutely. So one of the ones that I love um, is Baltimore did last, last year. It's called uh, Home Run Accelerator. Um, and they did exactly what I was describing. So we now a number of years ago helped them do a series of interviews with small scale manufacturers. One of the things that they found was that they have a ton of home-based businesses. And I will tell you in every community that numbers have already climbed because of the pandemic, uh, home-based businesses that were making some kind of product. And they there was a huge gap um, particularly with black owned businesses in Baltimore, not having access to property owners, not having access to training to understand how to make that jump. And so they created a training program actually led by somebody local. It was a 12 week program to train these businesses up on how to scale and use a space and market it and be successful in that transition. And then there were two other parts, right? They didn't just do the training. They had done the outreach to identify property owners who were interested in having these businesses and had spaces and they need introductions. 
and they had a small grant program to help to cover some of the costs of that transition for the businesses that were ready to make that jump. Um, it was an amazing program. Euclid, Ohio, who was in Recast Leaders last year, uh, also did a program like that on a slightly smaller scale. They competed assistance, did a six-week program in partnership with a company out of Chicago called 37 Oaks that has a training for product businesses who want to scale. Uh, and then they did a master lease on four small storefronts um, and so that they could um, actually reduce the cost of the space for the beginning for the small businesses who are moving into that space. And also because they took the master lease, it was more or less a good faith investment in that with that property owner so that they could finish the renovations on the space. So those are two different examples. Those are great examples. And just a quick kind of further point to that, you know, there we hear so much about business training programs. They like come out every week, we hear a headliner. And your point, Ilana, about these programs is that they're specific in scope of who they're trying to help. It's not generic business advice. And then it's matched with connections and actual funding and resources to put that learning into action. So I say that anyone who's considering business training to think about it more holistically. Um, yeah. And I'd take you a step further and I would say talk to the small businesses in your community first to find out what their needs and barriers are, because their number one need or barrier may have nothing to do with training. You are very right. <laughs> Next question here is what small manufacturing types of businesses have you seen success with? What downtowns uh, that downtowns can target? Absolutely. So downtown storefronts, I would say you predominantly want to focus on consumer products. Um, you know, and we have product businesses that are working in textiles, in food products, um, in wood. You probably don't want metal in the middle of downtown, but maybe on a backside of downtown. Um, Obviously, jewelry or any kind of accessories. Um, there's um, there, there's so many different kinds of, of consumer products. Um, lotion. I call there's a whole category I call lotions and potions. Um, the candles and the body, all the sort of the body hair content. Um, they're growing astronomically across the country, and they're finding ways to do it. So. The first thing that we do, actually, the second thing we do with Recast Leaders is help communities find the small scale manufacturers in the community today. Because one of the things I want you guys to take to heart is that it's important to build on who you have in your community today. This is not about recruitment. This is about finding who you have, taking care of them, helping them shine. And I promise you when they shine, you will, you will have naturally occurring recruitment happen because of it, because you're taking care of your own. Um, and so for us, it always starts with the small scale manufacturers that you have in your community. And it might be that there are part-time businesses who want to go full-time and get a storefront. You might not have people who are ready for storefront. We did a project with Allen Park, Michigan. Also, they were in the cohort last year. And they found that there, they had a ton of home-based businesses. Their downtown was really, really struggling still. And the small scale manufacturers that were home based weren't interested in being downtown yet because downtown was not all that yet. Right. And so one of we looked at different models, uh, pop up events, markets, a shared retail space. There were just tons of other ways to get there. But we had to understand the context of their small scale manufacturers. So I will go back to the talk to your business owners point. Yeah, and I and and also for those who may oh we don't have you know small scale manufacturers you do you, you do, do. <laughs> and and they live online and right now you don't see them because they're not being drawn out because you don't have the resources and support you know to, to bring them out and then also exactly. to Ilana your point of the lotions and potions businesses what's also great about these types of small scale manufacturers is that they're also very experiential so mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of these people who make candles or lotions they'll have the workshop make your own lotion you know mm -hmm. so now you're getting a whole traffic of people you know into your downtown and you're not planning that event the small businesses <laughs> which is always a bonus um, another question here, can you share an example of a commercial vacancy tax ordinance? Absolutely. So DC is probably the one that's the most well known. Obviously, that's a pretty big city doing that. DC did it a bunch of years ago, and it has made a remarkable difference. There's like, there's, there's one property in the middle of DC that was vacant for decades um, and paid the fee. And it stood out because there was one major one, and it was some, some international like 
as we, I don't actually know what the story was, but there was a lot of sort of urban myths around it. Um, but they put this in place a bunch of years ago and the fee is high enough that it really discouraged folks from sitting on vacant properties where 30 years ago, there were tons and tons of them. Um, 40 years ago. Uh, Mansfield, Texas also um, has one on their books. San Francisco just passed their ordinance about a year ago. So they're popping up in different parts of the country. Um, the thing I would look at is, well, I guess twofold. What it, one is, what is the language you need to use around this in your community? Um, so thinking about how do you say this in a positive way? Because a lot of times it's, it's called a, a vacant property tax. Um, and really thinking about how are you doing this as like a commercial responsibility kind of perspective, a, a community responsibility perspective, um, and really being clear about how these vacancies are taking money, not just of that one site, but they're taking money out of the community from around that block and around that part of the community. The other thing I would say is really looking at the numbers to figure out how high your fee needs to be to really make people change their mind about it and the oversight that you can put in place around um, building quality. Is it falling apart? Do you need enforcement to come in? How do you use different avenues to really make that property owner see that they should not sit on it, but they should sell? Um, the flip side of that, obviously, also is starting to identify who could be new property owners in your community and how could you get that property into the right hands. Hmm. Kind of on a similar line here, there's a question of um, where can people learn more in-depth information about these, you know, kind of four strategies that you outlined? Is there, there resources for that? Yeah, so the link to the article that you guys shared, actually, uh, when we put, we, that's an op-ed from Next City. Um, it has links to a lot of the examples in the article, so I would definitely suggest uh, checking those out. Um, the National Vacant Properties I don't know what they're called now. The The Center for Community Progress, which used to be the National Vacant Properties, um, uh, they have a lot of resources on, on a lot of these pieces. Um, but I would also recommend reaching out to individual cities if you see an example that you like. I believe that the best way we get there is by seeing what somebody's done, figuring out how to customize it, and just learning from their experience. We don't have to recreate everything from scratch. Yeah, exactly. And um, also, Judith just put the that link um, in the chat box, and also she had linked out a little bit further some of the information we have on TIF financing. Um, Judith, if you want to put that in there as well. Um, uh, another question here. I have a question regarding blighted properties. Since I live in a town in Connecticut, Enfield, which has a section called Thompsonville, and many of those properties are vacant and owned by a few wealthy families. So any thoughts on that? Right. This is this is the politics of, of wealthy families that might control politics in the community. Um, the, I think that there's a the question I would look at is, can you find even one or two property owners that are good faith partners? I always go to look at who do I think believes in the community and believes in the community's future. And I don't actually bother with the naysayers until we've proven success because we need to show what's possible and we need to build political will to do something different by showing what's possible. And so that's why we always focus on short-term wins with an eye towards the big hard stuff when we're working with our recast leaders uh, communities, because we want to make sure that we're finding the right people who are might not be involved in downtown. They might not be involved with small businesses or they might be already, but we want to pull them together so that they know that they have other people that they can talk to about this. And so um, a few, you know, property owners who really sit on, on property that's falling apart. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of communications that you can do around it. You might need an external partner to be able to do it or the local, if you have a local paper or online resource to really write about the impact of this on the community. Um, I think that it's really important to show people also that other communities have dealt with this. Um, and there's a lot of places that have turned the corner at this point um, where they really, you know, they really made it happen. Also need to acknowledge that the numbers might be upside down right now, right? The cost of, because of the neglect that they've done, right? Which we can't do anything about at this point, the cost of renovations to get that space into operating capacity and quality might not make any financial sense. And so then the question is, 
How do we help finance it? Are there grants we need to go after? Are there matching funds we need to create to create a few catalytic projects with people who are committed to doing interesting things? I think that is a really excellent point of focusing on the small wins that you can do that are within your control and and moving that momentum forward, building that kind of movement in your community to influence these property owners or influence the political leaders. Um, that shouldn't be underestimated. Yeah. Um, okay. Here's another question. In Thomaston, I'm interested in the idea of shared spaces and dual purposing store spaces. Is there a grant or any incentive programs you know of for property owners to contribute to repurposing their property? That's an interesting question. I don't know anything off the top of my head that's Connecticut specific. Um, ARPA money can be used for this, right? This is about economic opportunity and economic development. So um, anybody who has ARPA money sitting around, um, it can be used in this way. Um, that being said, it's not necessarily, if the, if the space is in an okay state of repair, it's not necessarily that expensive to create shared spaces. So if you have a storefront that's 2000 square feet, you can help identify three or four business owners that wanna share the space. And if they get to know each other well enough, they may not need any walls, or maybe they can come do the sweat equity to put up half walls. Um, there's a project in Dallas, uh, called Tyler Station, um, where they used a chain link fence um, to divide up the spaces so that there is secure space for each business, but it's really easy to move the walls as businesses want bigger or smaller spaces. So the cost of dividing up the space um, has been pretty low. So there are some really creative ways to get there that are pretty low cost um, and, and things that I would look at. Uh, you know, and then the other thing I would add about that is, and we didn't talk about this at all, uh, I have a whole separate rant about how to use your holiday markets as incubators, um, so that, you know, how your holiday markets or your fall festivals, I'm in DC, we have festivals every weekend, every day of every weekend right now, there's like nine of them. The vendors at those events, the people who are selling products or, or, or could be selling products at those events, every time they can be at an event, that is an incubator opportunity for them to work on product market fit and marketing and engaging them, not only seeing if you do have product vendors at those events, but engaging them or bringing more diversity of, of business owners into those conversations and those events um, is a way to I, not only bring them together and get them to have that opportunity, but then after the holiday markets, engage them to come together and big, and talk to them and see what they need. Mm -hmm. um, just related to that other question, there was, um, is can infrastructure funding be related to this? I don't know. That's an interesting question. Somebody should figure that out and tell me. <laughs> I don't know. Excellent. We have a few more minutes for questions, so I'll give you um, some time to write any additional questions in the chat box. And I have some questions for you, too, as we get more um, questions in here. You had an example with Zeke's, the coffee shop in there, and how uh, when they came in, it kind of created created this snowball effect in getting these other storefronts filled. Um, I'm curious if... Um, you know, uh, the, the, the business like Zeke's, are there characteristics of a business that has kind of that power or influence? Is it the business owner? Are they involved in the community that can kind of create that snowball effect? It's a really good question. Um, so on that corridor, I know that there's a Main Street organization. It's a corridor that has a fair amount of car traffic and very little foot traffic, but it has residential neighborhoods right behind the, that commercial, those commercial storefronts. Um, I don't know their involvement in the main street or in, in the neighborhood. Um, I just don't know those kinds of details. Um, I do know that one of the really key factors for them um, was this this multiple sources of revenue that they had a, a something that would draw people in the front door, right? Coffee, it doesn't take much, um, but that there, I would, I have not looked at their numbers, but I would bet the major revenue source for that site is the wholesale business that goes out the back door. 
Mm -hmm. um, and the way that that space was structured allowed them to do it um, and it allowed them to, to do both of those things. And so that's one of the reasons that I really look at small scale manufacturing is because you can look at something that does draw people in the front door because there is an activity, there's something dynamic to watch, there's something cool some cool story about them, but they're not just dependent on that foot traffic there. And um, having programs that help people grow their online sales or wholesale and understanding distribution obviously becomes a part of that. And I think like we said before, there, are very, there aren't that many uh, scaling business programs nationally at all. And they certainly, most of them have no idea about product distribution and scaling. Yeah. And so there's like two <laughs> that I've run into. Um, and so, um, and, you know, looking at Spanish language programming and, you know, what are, who's teaching the class and all of these different details that we need to, to take into consideration are all a part of that. No, excellent. That having that deep roots, deep roots, as you mentioned, you know, helping these small businesses have multiple streams of revenue and influencing is huge. Um, a question here, how does a commercial land trust work? What does the organization look like and how do they fund acquisitions or long-term property maintenance if it remains vacant for years? Are there tax incentives for those landowners who want to take a loss? What is the risk for the trust? Oh, this is a really good set of <laughs> questions. Um, I'm going to send you to another website to answer a lot of that. Um, uh, I'm just going to try to see if I can find it all at the same time. Um, so um, there's a whole world of resources about land trusts. Um, they apply to, mm, let's see if I can find the right place. They apply, I'm not gonna be able to find this while I talk. So I'll, I'll pull it and send it to you guys to share, but, but there's a whole world of, of what's written about land trusts. A lot of times that's written about housing. Um, it applies to commercial in the same way. Um, there's some really interesting examples out of, um, Los Angeles, I think it was, uh, Japantown in Los Angeles, they created a commercial land trust because they wanted to retain the heritage of the area. Um, they didn't want Japantown to be pushed out through gentrification uh, and, and have issues of displacement with this cultural area that was uh, important. Um, a commercial land trust for a downtown is, is very much the same thing. It's saying we want to retain space for our locally owned businesses. This could be the case, similar to what a community development corporation could do, which is the other way to look at this. Um, but a land trust is saying, we're not gonna, in most cases, we're not gonna do the development. We're gonna buy it and hold on to it like a land bank in many cases. Um, if it's in a state of good repair, we're gonna move people into it. We're gonna work on finding property owners for this. But if we sell it, it's going to have clauses in that sale that, that more or less, it keeps you focused on what that purpose is and what that outcome is. Um, so I will pull that uh, resource, but there's there's really, there are great experts on land trusts. Um, I mostly can say, go talk to the experts on land trusts. Excellent. Yeah, definitely the four kind of strategies that, that you had listed up all are their own one hour webinar to dive deep into and probably much longer than an hour, but really good information. And, um, and we'll send out that link. And when we wrap up, kind of um, post this webinar onto our website, we'll include any additional resources that we've talked about here. Any other questions that we have? Um, Elon, this was really excellent. Um, I, again, I think understanding why these vacant storefronts exist and actions that we can take um, and to underscore, you know, two points that you mentioned, focusing on the small wins um, and building your own momentum. We see that, you know, you mentioned the holiday pop-up shops. I mean, there's even kind of the more like temporary pop-up shops and in, in vacant storefronts. You know, I mean, there's so many kind of different things that a community can do, especially if you have, you know, a Main Street program or a downtown, um, you know, program there. And um, also, you know, the way that we support our small businesses, one, talk to them and let's not make assumptions about what they need and and let's be thoughtful in how we help them not try the same exact things over and over again and not really get the, you know, new results. Um, 
And let's just see here is, hello, great presentation. I'm an architect working with the EDC to help the town visualize what can be done. However, even with a, a steep grant, no one is utilizing. So talking about, there's that step grant, I don't, I don't know. Um, just uh, talking about underutilized resources. Um, awesome presentation, excellent. Ilana, any kind of last closing remarks or anything you'd like to add? I would definitely say um, reach out with any questions. I put my email address in there, but I'll put it in again. Um, you know, I, I every community is unique in what it's facing, um, and there are always commonalities too. And the the thing that I think is most important to remember is that you need to know where you want to go, what is that outcome you want to achieve, who needs to benefit from it, um, and then you got to go out and talk to the the, the targeted, super targeted people. Um, that need to be a part of that solution. And, and that's how we structure everything we do. Um, but understanding the opportunity around this for your downtown, I'm sure you guys know inside out and backwards because of the work that you do um, and understanding and articulating the urgency um, is an important step in the process as well. And um, I hope some of these resources help you along the way. Excellent, thank you so much. With that, I'm just gonna have a few closing remarks here as we just uh, end. Um, this presentation. Again, Ilana, thank you so much for your time this morning. This was great. Um, as a reminder, the Connecticut Main Street Network extends throughout the state. It includes professionally managed downtowns, neighborhood districts, municipal planning and economic development departments, and two regional organizations uh, representing the interest of many towns. We also have a professional affiliate membership program for industry professionals um, that can help you um, with your downtown revitalization, and preservation, marketing, and so much more. Um, and so if you're interested in becoming a member, you can reach out to us at ConnecticutMainStreet.org. Um, and as well, a reminder to our current members, please reach out to our field service director, Carl Rosa, to schedule a field visit, and you'll receive a copy of Ilana's new book, Recast Your City, How to Save Your Downtown with Small-Scale Manufacturing, where she'll even go into obviously more in-depth about all the ideas and topics that she talked about today. Um, and then also our, our website has a library of archived webinar, webinars, director, directory of our professional affiliate network, our small business library. And just for example, if you want to hear more ideas on this topic, um, we have a previous webinar called Vacant Property Solutions, Turn the Lights Back On, on our YouTube channel. You can check it out. Um, and uh, last call to sign up for our in-person in training from Problems to Partners, how to successfully engage merchants, property owners, and municipal departments. Um, and actually, you know, some of the topics we talked about today about political will and, you know, influencing property owners, um, this is absolutely in line. We're going to be talking about strategies um, that you can use right away to overcome some of these challenges. And the training will be on Thursday, September 29th. Um, it will include breakfast and also you'll receive a copy of Ilana's book there. And we're limiting this training to just 25 people. And the last day to register is this Thursday, September 15th. So if you're interested, please register ASAP. And the link to learn more and to register is gonna be posted in the chat box here. Uh, and we have two upcoming webinars supporting small businesses on Main Street on October 11th, and actually we'll be talking, um, we'll be hearing from a panel of people that kind of show some of the examples that Ilana was talking about in terms of how we can support small businesses um, and property owners to open up um, uh, vacant storefronts, but then also develop community and draw out uh, your, your business owners so that you can meet them and talk to them. And then we will also have a webinar in November on using public art for a more welcoming and vibrant community. Please stay tuned for the registration details there. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, you'll be receiving a evaluation after this webinar, please fill it out. These topics that we do, um, that we cover in our webinars are based on your evaluations. So let us know what is 
what's on your mind the most? What do you want to hear about? And we'll be sure to include that in our upcoming programming. And once again, thank you all for our sponsors and program partners. And once again, thank you, Ilana, for your time this morning and sharing your great insight. Thank you all for joining us.